Hi, I'm Al Cohen coming to you today from the Zoom room, thanks to COVID-19. And I'd like to share an interesting case of craniocerebral trauma that we recently cared for here. Uh, I'm the director of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. My email is below if anyone has any questions or comments. And this is a case that we recently uh, saw at Johns Hopkins, every pa parent's worst nightmare. This was a healthy 15-month-old baby boy who went to the pediatrician for a well-child visit and to get some shots. This was about 9 o'clock in the morning. He got the shots. He cried for about two minutes and stopped. The pediatrician left. Everything was going well, and mom was preparing to take him home. She turned away for a split second to get her bag and her keys, and she heard a thud, and the child had fallen off the table and struck his head on the floor. He was crying. He cried for about two minutes uh, and then stopped. And he seemed like his old self. Mom packaged him up, took him home, and put him down for a nap. She went to work and told her father who was watching him what was going on and came back in the afternoon. He didn't awaken, and so mom woke him up, but he wasn't himself. And she noted that his right eye was turning to the right and his left eye was turning straight forward. He was irritable. He vomited. Then he, gave, he became progressively more sleepy. And so mom called the pediatrician. They told her to call uh, the emergency medical service, which she did. The ambulance came. They looked at him, and he was progressively getting worse. Uh, they felt that he should be taken to Johns Hopkins immediately by heliport. And a helicopter came, and he was brought here. He was lethargic, obtunded, and became comatose. Uh, he was taken to Johns Hopkins by helicopter, and in the emergency room here, he became unarousable. He had a fixed and dilated right pupil, and we went for an emergency CT scan. The fact of the dilated right pupil is an ominous sign. It's a sign of impending doom after head injury. It's a third nerve palsy from compression of the brainstem. Uh, what we were concerned about was an expanding intracranial hematoma, a blood clot inside the skull pressing on the brain. Sure enough, that's what the CT scan shows. And this is an axial CT scan performed without contrast. And you can see the surrounding white area is the bone. The brain is gray. The black area on your right is his ventricle, the normal fluid. But this large white structure here, this lentiform or lens-shaped intracranial mass, is an expanding intracranial epidural hematoma. That is, it's inside the skull, but outside the brain, the dura mater is the tough mother, uh, the fibrous lining of the brain uh, is stripped away by a blood clot that's inside the skull. It's, it's lentiform because the dura is densely adherent to the uh, undersurface of the skull and has to be stripped away. So that's a characteristic picture, and that's an ominous sign, a big blood clot that's shifted the brain. The right is on our left side. It's on, this is on his right side. It's shifted the brain from the right to the left. And there's some areas of dark spots inside this acute epidural hematoma, which actually makes it a hyperacute epidural hematoma. That means that there's active, unclotted bleeding going on. And this is six hours later. So this poor little guy is having a lot of pressure on his brain. So what do we do in a situation like this? Well, time is brain. And the issue is we've made a diagnosis relatively quickly once he got here, and we have to institute the treatment. At the same time, we're trying to figure out what's going on. We have to do a procedure to get the blood out of the skull, out of the brain. And so we do an emergent craniotomy. And this is something we're a level one trauma center that we rehearse here uh, to mobilize the OR, a whole team of nurses and anesthesiologists, uh, neurosurgery, uh, uh, intensive care unit doctors converge on the patient. And, and what we have to do is do an operation to get this out as quickly as possible because the brain is under compression. And the third nerve palsy tells us that the, this is a life-threatening uh, procedure. This is a life-threatening condition, and we have to do this quickly. This is a very similar case. We worked so quickly in this case that I didn't have a chance to take pictures, but this is essentially the same. This is a young kid, and you can see there's a subgaleal hematoma. That's the right side of his head. Uh, it's positioned like this, and we make an incision in the scalp, and we make a burr hole on each side. This is a current jelly consistency blood clot, so it can't be removed through a single burr hole. We have to take a craniotomy, a piece of the bone up. But you can see as we elevate the bone, we've made a cuts in the bone, this a craniotomy, the mass of this hematoma is pushing the bone up away from the brain. And here's what it looks like, this current jelly uh, epidural hematoma. 
it's epidural outside the dura mater, the tough lining of the brain inside the skull. And you can see how it's expanded outside the head right here. And then we work underneath, and that's the dura underneath, and we uh, remove the blood clot. In this case, there was a fracture of the skull, which we repaired, and there was a lacerated branch of the middle meningeal artery, blood, a branch of the external carotid artery that comes up over the dura that was torn by the fracture. And believe it or not, six hours later, it was still bleeding. It was partially tamponaded by the mass effect of this hematoma. But we were able to remove this quickly, stop the bleeding, and then we sew the dura up to the bone to obliterate that epidural space and put the bone back and put them back together. And here's his CT. This is the patient's CT scan. And you can see there's air here, but the shift of the brain is gone. The epidural hematoma is gone. And kids are resilient. His pupil came down in the operating room. Uh, he awakened, uh, moving everything. Here he is on post-op day one. We have a little bare ears uh, head wrap on him, uh, but he was moving everything. Uh, by post-op day three, he made a dramatic recovery. And that's because if we can get to this quickly enough, kids can be normal. If we don't get to this quickly enough, this is something that is a lethal head injury. Uh, and here he is on post-operative day five when he went home. He was actually able to go home on post-operative day three, but uh, we wanted to keep him a little bit longer because of the severity of his injury. And his mom, uh, who is very grateful, is the one who is the hero here because she recognized that there was something wrong and got him quickly uh, to the hospital. Here he is on post-op day 10, and she sends me pictures pretty much on a daily basis. But he's back home where he belongs two weeks after surgery, back to a, being a normal 15-month-old kid. So this is head trauma, and head trauma is the leading cause of death in individuals under the age of 45. Two million Americans suffer a traumatic head injury uh, each year. And uh, 100,000 people will die within hours of the injury, again, because the brain is inside the skull. It's in a closed compartment. Half a million people require hospitalization, and almost 100,000 uh, develop irreversible loss of function. And pediatric head trauma causes twice as many uh, deaths as cancer and congenital malformations combined. The cost of the medical care, $100 billion per year in the United States, and the loss of lifetime productivity is something that's unmeasurable. The case that we have here, the epidural hematoma, is bleeding between uh, the dura mater, the tough mother, the fibrous lining of the brain, and the skull, and it compresses the brain. Uh, it's often from a torn branch of the middle meningeal artery, which was the case in, in this uh, patient. Uh, it was a fractured of the skull that tore this artery. 2% uh, uh, of all head injuries are epidural hematomas, and 15% of fatal head injuries are epidural hematomas. Usually it's arterial bleeding. Sometimes this can be from venous bleeding. Uh, there's a syndrome called talk and die, and that was made famous by uh, poor Natasha Richardson 11 years ago. She was the daughter of Vanessa Redgrave and Tony Richardson, the wife of Liam Neeson. She was 45 years old, and she was skiing in uh, Quebec. And she fell and uh, injured herself, but really felt OK. She pulled herself back together. She walked uh, off the slope and went to her hotel. Uh, and there she began to get headache and became progressively obtunded. She was admitted to a local hospital and transferred uh, by air to a hospital in New York City where she ultimately died two days later. And she died from an expanding epidural hematoma. And this is a, a syndrome called talk and die, where sometimes you can have an initial blow to the head, have a headache, maybe lose consciousness briefly from uh, the concussive injury to the brain, and then awaken and seem to be OK. You can talk, have a lucid interval. But then over time, where there's this expanding intracranial hematoma, there's compression of the brain, which can cause neurological disability and death unfortunately, in her case. That case is remarkable to me because at the time, 11 years ago, I got a call from uh, a family whose daughter, you see on the left here, a seven-year-old girl who was uh, the day before struck in the head by a line drive hit by her father, struck in the right temporal area, and she had a headache, it got better, uh, and they were putting her to bed, and she started to get a headache and, uh, and some vomiting. The family was watching TV and saw the news about what happened to Natasha Richardson and immediately brought her to a local hospital where they did a CT scan and found an acute epidural hematoma and had her life-flighted uh, to us. 
and this was her scan. And you can see now that's that lentiform, lens-shaped uh, epidural hematoma. This was on the left side, uh, and uh, it's expanding and compressing the brain. Uh, she was deteriorating neurologically, but she got to us quickly enough, and we operated, did the same operation. Here on the post-operative scan, you can see the hematoma is gone, and she recovered and made a full recovery. And so this was thanks to uh, poor Natasha Richardson. But this is the syndrome of talk and die, which is why we take all head injuries very seriously. Sometimes patients are waiting in the emergency room. Uh, if we neglect them, they can uh, deteriorate rapidly. So we try to stay on top of head injuries as quickly as we can. And the reason of this talk and die, the reason this is a problem, is this is a picture of the base of the skull. And when there's an expanding mass lesion, it could be outside the brain, inside the brain, but what it does is it pushes the medial aspect of the temporal lobe, the uncus, over the midline uh, to compress the midbrain here. And that arrow is pointing to where the third cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve, comes out of the brainstem. And uh, the midbrain uh, has um, the motor fibers that control movement on the left side of the body. That nerve, the third cranial nerve, causes the pupil to constrict. Uh, that's the Edinger-Westphal nucleus of the midbrain, controls the, the pupillary constriction. When that's compressed, the pupil dilates, and the, uh, the, the standard finding of transtentorial herniation is a motor deficit, weakness or paralysis on the opposite side, and a dilated pupil. In our case, our 15-month-old kid had a dilated pupil. And why that's ominous is because it's compressing the brainstem. It means if we can't get that hematoma out, if we can't get the pressure off the brain, death is imminent. And that's transcentorial herniation. And this, again, is the epidural hematoma. You can see the lens. This is another case, a lens-shaped lentiform hyperdensity. It's bright. That's blood uh, compressing the brain. And that's what it looks like at surgery, this current jelly consistency uh, mass. It's a simple operation. We need to do it quickly. We take off the bone. We remove the blood clot. Uh, we obliterate this space so it can't come back again and stop any of the bleeding. Uh, but that can be a life-saving operation. And what's um, remarkable about this is that if patients don't get to medical attention quickly enough, they don't survive. If we can get to the patient and get this out, they can have not only survival, but a normal life, as is the case with our little youngster. So in terms of the take home for pediatric head trauma, the things that are red flags that we look for are after a head injury, kids can cry, but persistent irritability or vomiting, uh, persistent lethargy, behavioral abnormalities out of the ordinary, presence of seizures, or some type of neurological deficit, which could be visual changes, weakness, uh, gait difficulties. Something out of the ordinary raises a red flag, and it's better to be safe than sorry to have the kid taken a look at. So that's pediatric head trauma in a nutshell, and this is an acute epidural hematoma, a remarkable case. Uh, thank you for your attention, and a remarkable kid.